church this Sunday morning. Glad to have each and every one of you in our Sunday school hour. Glad to be able to come in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. Take your maroon hymnal. There should be one in the seat back in front of you. We'll turn it to 805, 805. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives is our opening song, 805. Let's go ahead and stand here, folks. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love. He and forgive. He tried and died. to God in prayer this morning. Lord, we are so thankful that this song is true, that you do live. You're sitting at the right hand of God this morning. Make it intercession for us, and we thank you for that, oh God. Lord, we thank you for a God that came and saw the need to become man, and not just to come and look upon man, but come and die for man. And Lord, you didn't stay dead, but you rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, God. And we thank you for that because we serve a risen Savior this morning. And God, I pray that we just rejoice in the fact that our God lives on high. So God, I pray that our hearts are come ready and expecting to hear from you today. Lord, I pray upon the preaching that is to come, that you do have a mighty work and you use it, Lord, to change lives this morning. Because God, we need you, Lord. We need you more than we know in an ever-wicked world. And God, I pray that you just use the messenger to deliver what you have for us. And God, we pray, Lord, that we leave uh, better uh, for coming to your house this morning and just rejoice in that we have you, God, above all things. So thank you for all you do. I pray that you continue to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 
You may be seated, but at this time, I'll ask the teen boys and girls in the school class to be dismissed. Oh, this. Oh, you're right. Stay. They are staying. Oh, no dismissing today. You guys are staying put. All right. And we will do our books of the Bible this morning. Our books of the Bible, we start with the Old Testament and we finish in the New. So let's start off in Genesis and make our way to Revelation. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, and the Revelation. Amen. And let's continue on. We'll go to a verse of the week, which is taken from 1 John 2, 15 and 16. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Fairly familiar verses to, should be most of us. But what we'll do is, I'll have you repeat after me the first time. Then if you have a copy of it or you know it from memory, say, we'll say it all together. And I'll see if we have maybe one person that knows it this morning so we can uh, say our verse. So here we go, repeat after me. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. 16. Love not the world, world. neither the things that are in the world. world. If any man love the world, the the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Let's all say it together. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Amen. Do we have one that may know it this morning? All right, Alex. Just miss the ands between them. There are two ands between each. Right. One quick one to see if we get it right, Miss Addy. So for the rest of us, let's continue to study that to get it right. We will come right back to our verse during the evening service. So at this time, I'll ask our ushers to make their way forward. As they make their way forward, I'll ask you, Brother Murray, can you go ahead and pray for the Sunday school hour?
All right, let's get ready to take some time in our Sunday school hour to pray for the missionaries that are around the world doing the work of God. They deny themselves the pleasures of home so the gospel could be brought to people that may not have heard it otherwise. So at this time, I'll ask Brother Cornelius, can you pray for missionaries, please? Before we get ready to pray for Chicago uh, preachers, I'll ask that if all the folks on this side can move to our right side, we want to get more of a class feeling for us on the school hour. So please feel free to fill it in. We have plenty of room here. Our ushers can help find seats for those on our left to move to our right. So if we could do that a little bit expediently, we can continue our Sunday school hour. So just asking, can you help the young people find a seat, ushers? Make our way to the right side. Thank you for moving expediently so we can continue moving through our Sunday school hour. There's a room. Thank you. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. <clears throat> thank you for, Lord, um, Pastor Carl Lubin just coming uh, to preach your word today. Lord, I pray that the hearts will be open. Lord, I pray that hearts will be um, softened. Pray that ears will be open. Lord, pray that you will prepare, um, prepare uh, this service, Lord, so souls can get saved. Lord, I pray for more preachers in Chicago. Lord, I pray for more young men from the right churches. Lord, it's rare that we see young men uh, I want to have a zeal um, to give out your word or to give out your gospel. Lord, I pray um, for more laborers um, that bring, um, bring them in, Lord. Lord, harvest is ready, Lord, but the laborers are few. Lord, we want to um, Lord, just pick out um, whoever you want us to pick out, Lord. The ones that are ready, Lord, to come forward, spend time with you, uh, spend life with you um, for eternal uh, destiny. Lord, I pray for more preachers in Chicago that are bold. Lord, this world is so wicked, Lord, where you have a lot of wickedness against a little bit of good, Lord, the wickedness will um, overcome, Lord, with your power, Lord, nothing is impossible. So, Lord, I pray for preachers that um, stand strong. Lord, I pray for more preachers that Lord, have a right life outside of the Justin Church. Lord, have a right relationship with you. Lord, there are sheep, there are wolves in sheep's clothing. Lord, a lot of them today. Lord, as you said in your word, Lord, there will be. And Lord, I pray for more preachers that are genuine. More preachers that um, have the right relationship with you outside of church. Lord, I pray for preachers that, um, are leading um, the sheep, Lord, leading uh, the flock in the right way, Lord, the church. Lord, I pray for um, preachers that, Lord, just have a zeal. Lord, have a burden for lost souls. Lord, they look at lost souls um, all around the world. 
Lord, then they want to change that, Lord, specifically right here in Chicago. So, Lord, I pray that you, you would help us to honor you today, help us to glorify you. I pray that we worship you. In Jesus' name. worship with you all this Sunday, and as Pastor Lewis just shared, uh, I, I, I share the sentiment. I've been following your old ministry from the armchair as well, and just the last couple of years, you may know we're, I'm good friends with Brother Jericho, and you know we both share uh, the same ethnicity, Haitian, and so that's my, that's my brother right there, and uh, he came to minister in our church in Elmont. We're just outside of Queens. If you've ever been to JFK Airport, that's like 15 minutes from where we are, and uh, one thing you should know, you probably know, especially here in a city like Chicago, it's the world at your doorstep. So people from all over the world come to cities like New York. And so most of our members uh, are, is they're, they're immigrants to our country and raising their kids and they've gotten saved and just searching for truth and serving the Lord together. And although we have different accents all throughout our congregation and different types of foods at the potlucks, we all share the same vision of following Christ and serving Christ and reaching our community. And I, I sense that here, your love for God, your love for your own community here. And that's what this Lord's Day is about, this Friend Day. And so very, very grateful for the opportunity uh, to be a part of that. And as Pastor Lewis shared, my wife Pam and I, we've been married for this February will be 10 years. And so I'm thankful that she's put up with me for this long and hopefully for much longer and trying to raise our two kids for Jesus as well. But in the time we have this morning, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Now, I want to speak on prayer in our Sunday school class this morning. And I'm thankful that already at the start of our Sunday school, we've had the spirit of prayer here. And I know that that's the vision, the burden your pastor has, is we can do nothing without prayer. Amen. When I was a young man, younger man, I got in the bad habit of thinking I can keep driving my car, it starts to get to empty, I can keep going. I can keep going just a little bit longer. I can make it maybe another day or two, you know, money's a little bit tight, paying the school bill and everything. And then before you know it, I remember one day down in Tennessee where I went to Bible college, right on I-75 there, I'm driving in my car and it starts to sputter and shake and I'm like, what's going on? And I realized, oh yeah, I never filled up the tank. Now, God was gracious to a young, foolish brother there and allowed me to pull up right off the interstate. There's a gas station right there, and I literally sputtered in, and it just died on me right at the pump. I learned a valuable lesson that day, that there are priorities that we ought to have in our lives that help to fuel us. Otherwise, we can never keep on going. Sometimes, if we're not careful in our Christian life, we think, I'm too busy to pray. I don't have time to pray. 
and prayer takes a back seat because I got to teach this class or I got to run here or do that or I got to take care of the bills or the laundry or the kids or the, uh, answer all these phone calls, the emails. And we don't realize that prayer really is the fuel, it ought to be the lifeblood of our Christian life, that we can't go a day without meeting with the Lord. And in Daniel chapter 9, we're going to see the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that the Bible says availeth much. A great example of prayer in the life of Daniel. Let's begin reading. I'll read from verse 1 here. The Bible says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Azarius, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day. To the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all this, the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. And though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants and the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges, and judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. O now, O Lord our God, Thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and hast gotten thee renowned as at this day. We have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O Lord our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations in the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, 
O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Let's pray before we continue this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of prayer. May we glean the truth from the example of your servant Daniel, take it and apply it to our own lives and our own situations today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. I want to teach this morning on the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Daniel is an amazing man of God. He was an amazing prophet. If you ever uh, want to fortify your faith, how can we know the Bible is the Word of God? You know, some people say, well, the Koran and all these other writings, and how can we know the Bible is different from all these other books? The book of Daniel is a great testimony to the fact that this is God's Word. Daniel predicted the rise of the Babylonian Empire, the rise of the Greek Empire, the rise of Julius Caesar even, the rise of the Roman Empire. Daniel's even predicting things that still haven't even happened yet that will take place in the tribulation period. And it's so incredible and so specific, his prophecies, that the skeptics pull their hair out and say, you know, maybe he, he wrote these after the fact. It's a forgery. Maybe he wrote them after the Romans came to power. And they have no answer to the fact that this is God's word, prophecies that have been fulfilled, and a great testimony that this is the word of God. Daniel himself was an amazing character of the Bible. We read in Daniel chapter 1 as a young boy ripped from his home, taken into slavery, ripped from Jerusalem as a young boy, and brought to a foreign country in Babylon there. And there uh, they tried to really Babylonianize him. you got to become like one of us, speak like us, eat like us, walk like us, smell like us. But he said, no, sir, I'm going to follow my God and his plan for my life. And he refused to go after what they were forcing him to do, took a stand for God as a young person, by the way. But here we see Daniel's example in prayer. You see that his prayer, ultimately what we can take from this, his prayer was not even so much just his desire to come up to God, Lord, here, come over on my side and see my way of doing things. His prayer was a response to, Lord, this is who you are, and I'm convinced this is what your will is. May it be done. I want to encourage you, that's the way we ought to pray, that we can have confidence in our prayer, that it's not just, God, uh, come over and let me show you what I want you to do. You come down to my level and let me show you what I think, think, how I think things should be. That's not effectual, effectual prayer. Effectual prayer is, Lord, this is what you want and what you have promised, and I'm convinced it's going to come to pass, therefore I'm going to pray on that. Amen. And that's what we see in Daniel's testimony here. Prayer as a response to God's word. That's a great formula for prayer. Charles Spurgeon said, oh, that we studied our Bibles more, that we could plead his promises. How often we should prevail with God when we could hold him to his word and say, fulfill this word unto thy servant, whereon thou hast caused me to hope. Oh, it is grand praying when our mouth is full of God's word. For there is no word that can prevail with him like his own. Isn't that incredible? That we pray God's word back to him. Lord, this is what you said. This is what you've promised. And you're a promise-keeping God. And so prayer is not just kind of hoping like, I hope it doesn't rain this Sunday for Bring a Friend Day, right? Or if you're in New York, or I hope the New York Knicks have a, a good basketball season. It may happen, it may not happen. No, a Bible hope is a confident expectation. God, you said and so here's my prayer, believing. That's the kind of prayer Daniel had. It's also a great demonstration of intercessory prayer, praying on behalf of others. Oh, do we live in a city? Do we live in a nation that they, what we're doing this morning, they're the opposite? We want to follow Christ, learn of Christ, best we know how. We're not perfect. None of us in this room are. But we're trying to model our lives after God, but we're living in a world that wants to do the opposite, heading in the wrong direction, but... We want to see them come on board, amen? amen? And we're praying for people that don't, they don't even know what they need. We know what they need. Amen. But we need to intercede for them. Daniel did that. So a couple of quick things here. Daniel's, for, number one, Daniel's method of praying. Daniel's method of praying. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 6, if you want to turn there, you can. Daniel 6 and verse 10. Sometimes da praying got Daniel in a little bit of trouble, but that's okay. We do things, we obey God rather than men. 
But you read Daniel 6, a powerful testimony. But in Daniel 6, verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows, being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Daniel had a habit of prayer. It wasn't just, hey, if there's a crisis, now it's time to pray. Hey, there's a sickness, emergency bills, or whatever, relationship problems, now it's time to pray. Listen, God will hear your prayer in those times of emergency too, but wouldn't it be better to have a habit of prayer? Mountaintop, the valleys, good, bad, that we just have the habit of prayer. You know, prayer is so important. The Bible is how God speaks to us. Prayer is how we speak to God. And listen, some of you, maybe your parents or grandparents, or especially grandparents, maybe I only hear from my kids when they want money. I only hear from my kids when they have, there's a problem, right? And they don't like that very much. Well, how much does God, we only come to him, hey, I need your help now. You know, Daniel had a habit of prayer, three times a day even. Now, that may not be a prescription for you or my life, but it's a great example to think about. Wow, what about, what's my habit of prayer? Do I have appointments with God? that I set aside everything in my life. Daniel was a very busy man. He was a nobleman. He was a civic leader and a spiritual leader. He had a lot on his plate. And even as a pastor sometimes, I'm convicted that, man, we need to be praying more. That actually that's the first call is to, to prayer and the ministry of the word. But Daniel three times a day prayed. He knelt to pray. I'm thankful. My mom raised me and my sister, and she taught us and again, this is not, there's nothing mysterious or superstitious about this, but she taught us kneeling to pray. I would kneel down on her bedside. I think of my grandparents who lived with me, and they're both in heaven now. The, the greatest Christians I know are my grandparents, and I would kneel at their bedside as they prayed in French and Cray Hall and barely understanding what they're praying, but seeing that example. And why, why, why kneel? Because we're acknowledging who are we coming before? Amen. A holy God a majestic God, a marvelous God, the creator of the universe. We're not just coming to some uh, Jesus is my homeboy figure, the, some, some you know, cold, casual. We're coming before the presence of God Amen. with reverence. I know this church is different than some of the other churches around here. And some people think that it's all about having a big concert, jumping up and down, shouting like you're going to some rock, rock concert. But when you come before the presence of God, there ought to be a reverence. Amen. There ought to be the recognition that who am I coming before? I'm glad I look across the room. Hey, we put on our Sunday best. Amen. Whatever your best is, but I'm coming before the presence of God. That matters. It means something. It's special. It's important. And so Daniel knelt. He faced Jerusalem. That was the prescription for, old, for the Jews in that day because that was where, they, where the temple was, or should be. The temple at this point is destroyed, but here's faith. The temple is in ruins and rubble, but he's facing towards Jerusalem to pray. In the New Testament, we don't have to be in a location to pray. You can pray from anywhere, because the presence of God, if you're saved, is within. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, so you can be anywhere. You can be at work. You can be riding. I know in New York we ride the subways. You guys, what do you guys do, metro or buses? and Wherever you're at. You better be praying, amen? Driving these streets. I was riding around with your pastor, and everybody in my back, back home was telling me, are you going to Chicago? Are you prayed up? I said, guys, you know people say the same thing about New York. Don't act like it's different. Come on now. But we need to be praying. Wherever we are, pray without ceasing, the Bible says. You can be anywhere, and you can pray. And Daniel had these habits he had an appointed time. He had a method. That's important. I think we are creatures of habit, and there's things that we ought to be doing that are habitual, on purpose, determination. It's not just whenever I get the feeling. No, there was an intentionality behind his prayer life. The Bible talks about how he prayed with fasting. Do you ever fast and pray? Has God ever led you to be so burdened that some things just won't happen without fasting and praying? He prayed with sackcloth and ashes. 
You know, in those days, that was the sign of mourning and, and a desperation that you would tear your clothes off, you would have sackcloth and ashes, and there was, those were emblems of our humiliation, our, our, our desperation, like, God, we desperately need you to do something. He was desperate about it. So Daniel had a habit of prayer, but Daniel also had confidence in his prayers. Let's go back to Daniel 9, and just to set the big picture here, and why this prayer is so special. The children of Israel at this point are, are being judged by God. Because they forsook God, they went after idols, God sent other nations to judge them, and they were ripped from their homes there in Judah, in Jerusalem, and taken into slavery into Babylon. So they're, not, they're no longer in the promised land. They're no longer there. The temple is destroyed. The city's in ruins. They're in judgment. They're in a foreign land as captives. But Daniel knew his Bible. And Daniel read the prophet Jeremiah. And God used Jeremiah to tell the people of Israel that this judgment would last for a predisposed purpose, a, a, a length of time. Seventy years. Seventy years. And Daniel, knowing his Bible, and he was a brilliant man, he said, Lord, it's about time. We're coming up on time. And the, the, the reason this prayer is so special is that God would answer this prayer. They would, a, a pagan king, Cyrus, would come aboard and out of the blue say, hey, you people of Israel, why don't you go ahead and go back to Jerusalem and rebuild your city? In fact, I'll even give you some money and bankroll that effort. Wouldn't that be amazing if the president of the United States said, hey, you know, we need more churches started all over the U.S. Let's, let's support churches. Boy, that would be the day, right? That's kind of what happened here. And Daniel prayed for it because he knew God promised it. He knew God said there would be 70 years of captivity, then you would return back to your land. And so Daniel is saying, God, you said, like our children say to us, Dad, you promised. And maybe his parents were like, oh, boy. And the Bible says, how much more does your heavenly father want to give good gifts to his children? God is not saying, oh, man, you're holding me to this, really? God doesn't do that. God says, yes, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I was waiting for you to be ready for that. I was preparing you for this. And we say, God, this is what you yourself promised. It's time for us to return back. He understood, the Bible says in Daniel 9, verse 2, he understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. The 70 years were about up. And so he could pray this prayer, Lord, can we return back? Back to our land. Back to the temple, worship and being restored as your people and that the world around us would know that. That's a big prayer he was praying. But he was able to pray this prayer because he knew the word of God. And so we, all, we need to saturate our minds, inform our minds with the word of God. Why? The word of God lets us know the will of God. See, the nature of prayer really, the, it hinges on how can I discover what God's will is and pray God's will? That's the nature of prayer. For example, go with me to John chapter 15. I know some people have been confused about prayer. Some people think prayer is like, you know, Aladdin and the genie, three wishes. All right, I want this, I want that, I want this. That's not prayer. God is not your or mine's butler. They just go around doing whatever we think he should do. That is not prayer. Prayers, Lord, you are a loving heavenly father. You know what's best for my life. What is your will? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what prayer is. So when we pray, we need to discover the will of God so we can pray it. In John 15 and verse 7, Jesus said, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. I don't know about you, but I have some prayer requests in my life. And there's some burdens that I, I want to see God move and God work. And here God gives a promise that, listen, when you get a hold of truth and you discern my will and pray in confidence, it will be done. Do you know you can pray and thank God in advance for the answer? 
You know you can do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, go to 1 John. We're in the Gospel of John. Go to the back of your New Testament. Go to 1 John chapter 5. You can be so convinced that this is God's will in your prayer that you expect the answer is on the way and you live as if the answer is on the way. 1 John chapter 5, that little epistle of 1 John 5 verse 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. There's a lot promised here in these scriptures, but essentially it's when you know you're praying the will of God, you can have confidence. And you can even be confident that he not only has heard you, but he's answering and it's on the way. Notice what it says again in verse 15. And if we know that he hear us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired, and we know that what we've asked, he will answer. And Daniel exemplifies that. Praying according to the will of God. Here's where some Christians get confused. How can I know the will of God? Well, you need to get to know God. When you read the word of God, you see what God's done in the past. Lord, this is what you've done for faithful believers in the past. You can do that for me. You know what God is more likely to do? Lord, by your spirit, I'm convinced, Lord, this, this is something that you desire for us. In our church, we've seen some pretty remarkable prayer requests answered over the years. Some highlight prayer requests I'll just quickly share with you. Uh, our church started, a, you know, similar to you guys, a small storefront and, in need of a building. And God, in 1998, provided a 10,000 square feet building. It used to be an old fish market. And for Less than $300,000, which in, real, in New York real estate, that is just a miracle. God did that. We were able to purchase that property. Now, a million dollars needed to be put in to fix that building. We were in debt for many, many years, paying $7,000 a month in loan payments. We were praying, Lord, would you take this burden that we could pay everything off in full in March 2020, right before COVID hit. We made our last payment and burned the mortgage. And that was a powerful testimony. I'll just quickly tell you, we were supposed, we had six more years left to pay that debt off. I forget how much, $300,000 left, I think, left on the debt. And six years, now I told the church, let's do it in half. And we prayed, and many gave. You know why they gave? Because they knew this was the will of God. We've been praying about it. The answer's on the way, and we're going to live like it. So we're going to give, because we know the answer's coming. This debt's going to be paid off quickly. So we were expecting God to do it in three years. We did it in two years. And the Lord provided that great miracle, March 2020. We paid that debt off. Our church was next door to a nightclub. They promoted themselves as New York's number one reggae Caribbean nightclub. And so we would show up on Sunday mornings and all types of filth and junk on the floor more, uh, immoral perversion, evidence of that, drugs, bullet holes, vomit, blood. One morning, a man shot dead and right in front of our church doorstep, my mom and several ladies cleaning up the blood that was left there. And so we were praying, Lord, we need this to go. This can't stay here. And we prayed and prayed and prayed for many, many years. I think about 20 years we were, the church was praying for that. And then they themselves applied for an expansion with the town. And when, they, when you apply for a variance, they call it, anyone, any neighbor is allowed to attend that hearing at the court and share why they think they should not expand. So we went down there with the intention that, listen, we don't want them to expand, that is for sure. We explained the problems that we had there, the crime, the immorality. And do you know, two weeks later, I'm sitting at the barbershop getting my hair cut, and the guy said, hey, preacher, you know your church closed down that nightclub? I said, what in the world are you talking about? Hey, you, you guys closed down moments. The nightclub's closed. I said, what are you talking about? Yeah, they got their liquor license pulled and they closed up shop. And we did some digging and found out not only were they denied their expansion, they were just completely taken out of the town, said, no more, we don't want you here. God did that. God answered that prayer. God worked in that situation. 
And I'm so thankful. I know the testimony, there's testimonies here in your church and what God's doing. And Pastor Lewis shared the, the mortgage being paid off and, and how God's provided the souls that have been saved. And it's incredible when God answers prayer, isn't it? And it convinces us that, that God is real. And it persuades us to continue going forward praying with confidence. I want to quickly close because a lot of this prayer in Daniel 9 is about intercession. And that's really what this friend day is also about. We're praying for people with needs. And it's easy for us to think, Lord, the problem is them. But when you look at Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9, he includes himself. He said, Lord, we have forsaken you. Lord, our iniquities. He, he includes himself, Lord, I'm part of the problem. Mind you, Daniel is a godly man. There's not one recorded sin in the Bible of Daniel's life. That doesn't mean he was perfect. He was a sinner like you and I are. But he included himself, Lord, we are the problem, and you alone are the answer. And he was begging for God to work, not on based on how good I've been. Lord, because I've been such a faithful follower of you, this is why you should bless me. He said, Lord, because of your mercies, because you're a merciful God, because of your, your covenant, your promises that you've made to us as your people. Because of your glory that's on the line because the nations around us are looking and watching. Lord, would you come through for us? That's a great way to pray for America, for Chicago, for New York City, for Los Angeles, for San Francisco, the area where my wife grew up. And Listen, we're praying and we're interceding. Lord, it's not because of how good we've been. Certainly we haven't been. But we need your mercy. You're a merciful God. You're a long-suffering God. And there are remnants of believers. I want you to be encouraged all throughout America that are praying that prayer. And we need to be interceding on behalf of those around us. May God help us. May God encourage us to turn from our own sin, to see the holiness of God, his mercy. And instead of complaining, begin confessing like Daniel did. Begin seeking and pleading the promises of God. Let's close with prayer, and I'll give it over to Pastor Lewis. Father, we again thank you for your word and the opportunity to preach and teach your word. I pray that you would encourage us to be people of prayer, or even in my own life, that we would have the habit of prayer, we would have confident expectation in prayer, that we would be interceding in our prayers. Give us a blessed Lord's Day. May many visitors come. May the rain not be a hindrance, but even an opportunity maybe for some to come that maybe wouldn't otherwise come, that would hear your gospel and decide to follow Christ as Savior. Bless the remainder of our meetings today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.